When you deep dive into the world of your subconscious mind, you will meet the powerful creator that you are meant to be. Leave old and dysfunctional patterns behind. Have and become what you really want and not just what you think you can. Develop a new relationship with the world and embrace your true destiny. Welcome to the Prosperity Mindset with Robert Sempesh. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Prosperity Mindset. As you know, in this channel, we discuss topics and ideas that will give you the resources to help you create a better life, to improve the quality of your relationships, improve your finances and your personal health, so you can create an overall well-being, which is referred to as prosperity. And today I have an amazing guest here on the show who is a revolutionary thinker. He's a visionary, a leading edge healer, an author who believes that we cannot experience long lasting inspiration and motivation without having a vision and being connected to our intuition. This man is a dynamic and enthusiastic person. He is looking at the world through non-restriction, no, no conformity, no rule or regulation. And he believes that the evolution of mankind depends on the ability of people to be creators rather than repeaters. Many things on our planet work well, he says, but many others simply do not. So please welcome Luis Martin Simons. Welcome, and it's great to have you on this show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure, Robert. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm super excited. And um, what I'd like to show here is many years ago, I was struggling with all kinds of health issues. And a friend of mine gave me a recommendation of, of this book that you wrote. And this book completely changed my life. And I can sell this book countless times a week. I recommend it to all my students, all my clients. And this book is called, Does Your Body Lie? And I'd like to ask, where is this, uh, what is the story of this genius book? What has led you to write it? What inspired you to uh, create this amazing book? Well, it goes back to 1994, so 26 years ago. And um, because the relationship with my wife was not good, my wife at that time was not that good, I ended up in a course in Paris, in the south of Paris, in France, um, about healing. I don't know exactly how I, how I went there, but I did. It was in October 1994. And um, it was my first experience with healing, the, my first experience with symptoms. And I was very much surprised because there were three things, three symptoms I carried from for 20 years uh, that all disappeared during that course. It was a course, a two days course. And I had a lack of sense of smell. And I, ever since then, I always had the sense of smell. So I, I, re, I regained it. I never lost it again. I had chronic headaches and uh, they disappeared completely. I have never had headaches ever since. And I had blood in my urina. I was urinating blood. And uh, that symptom stopped as well. So I said, hey, I don't know why I came here. Well, of course, it was not by chance. There was a fun, there was a purpose. And uh, I decided to dig in. So I started reading and I decided to go everywhere where you could find healing courses. So I traveled doing and reading and already doing my experience. So very quickly, I started receiving people, people who wanted to know about the, the relation between body and mind. And at that time, I was not an expert, but they gave me a lot, a lot of experience. So it, I started creating some kind of a methodology and I kept on going to other courses and other seminars and reading this and that and that. And I, I went mostly uh, looking for Eastern, traditional Eastern knowledge, traditional Eastern thinking. Although almost all the courses were given by, they were run by European or American people. And um, 
it just changed my life. So ever since I started understanding what is the relationship between the body and the mind. So people would say it happened by chance. They didn't, of course. There was a crucial function there, a crucial purpose, because ever since I started doing that. And then in, uh, 19, in 2007, there's an editor here in Portugal where I live who said, I know you have such a knowledge about symptoms. Why don't you write a book? I had already written three books before. And I said, okay, I'm not sure I want to write that book because it's so much information that I have to go back to. But I did. So I spent a whole year, 2007, writing the book. And uh, then uh, um, it was not a book because it was a book in my own mother language, in Portuguese. But uh, I wanted it to go everywhere in the world. So I've, 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 I found someone who created me this website called flowsandforms.com. And it's after the flowsandforms.com, which is free, was uh, available to everybody in uh, internet that finally I decided to print the book. And today you have the uh, hard copy of the book as you show, have shown. Uh, it's available at Amazon. This, this is, is incredible. I, 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 I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. So what, what I have found in this book, and it's, of course, it's, you know, say <clears throat> over 400 pages long, is that you even talk about the functions or pain in certain teeth and how that leads back to family patterns and, and ancestral traumas and all this. Like, you must have really studied it hard because I have found this to be incredibly accurate. I mean, it's so accurate, it's almost spooky. So like how, how many years of studying has gone into this book? Well, uh, many people have written books about uh, the mind and body relationship uh, all over the world. You have some people in America, you have some people in France, you have some people, uh, many in France, uh, you have some people in Germany, you have some people over there in the Far East. And I've read them all. And at a certain point in time, I realized they were not all saying the same. And um, I started having, again, I got rid of my headaches and I got rid of my, uh, I got, I regained my sense of smell, but I started having real issues with my kidneys again. So I went for, and that happened in, uh, it was this, I started in 94, this was in 99, 2000. And I said, okay, and every book I went to, to check on kidneys, it was not enough for me. And then I went to many conferences and many workshops and it was not enough for me. And I said, oh, I have. And then what I did is I, I connected all those books, all the knowledge I had receiving people for years and years in consultations, if you want. Then I decided to emerge. So I was not okay with what some of the, those writers had written. So I decided to purify the thing according to my experience. So it came from the knowledge of others but it was, if you want, purified by my own experience because some of the things the other ones were saying just didn't make any sense to me. But it was not enough, Robert, because I still had to go on dialysis. And I did dialysis for four years. Wow. And it's only when I was in the dialysis rooms, it's something very heavy, many people go through it and I went, uh, it's only when I was there that I understand, understood lots of things about body, mind, and especially kidneys. And if you read my book, the organ that is the most detailed explanation is kidneys. Because I could never find it anywhere. I had to, I, it had to sprout from within, if you want. And so it was from my experience. This is amazing. I, I can totally relate because... 11 years ago, I was partially paralyzed by a stroke. And uh, most of it was, uh, you know, from the unhandled baggage, childhood trauma, past life traumas, and, and so on and so forth. And, and that is one of my specialties. I, I kind of like similar to you, I detangled, you know, the, the thousands of aspects of it. And what really is exciting for me uh, uh, meeting you and, 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 you know, having this interview face to face is how 
you had mentioned that you read many books and, and there's good knowledge in books, and yet it wasn't really giving you the results you wanted. And this is what I hear from uh, some of my students and some of my friends or people I meet. It's like, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so the kidney, for example, symbolizes relationship problems. And what? Then what? Like what specifically? How do I go about it? Right? So this is sort of a a bit of a turnoff to most people when there's these spiritual truths and reasonings. And what I like about, you know, your approach and, and, and similarly to what I have done is that we really give people a very detailed and very specific recipe that's relatable. So I, I really appreciate your, your work. And, and as I mentioned that, I, I recommend it all the time. It has helped me and I'll continue using it. And one thing I'd like to ask you, is when you do healing, do you consider yourself a healer or do you consider yourself a business person? Do you consider yourself a speaker? Like, like what is sort of the main identity that uh, would describe you? What is a healer? Right. Um, I consider myself none of those. None of those, okay. Um, one of the things, I'm not a healer. I'm a guy that who sometimes heals helps people heal themselves because it's you drive it and you trigger it, but it's always, always up to the person to get healed. So um, you just mediate the thing if you want. Mediate between whom and whom? Between some kind of a, a force that comes from heaven somewhere and the individual. It's not, we can call it heaven, it's something that is invisible. I work with the invisible. I work with subtle energy, and um, what I do is I humbly channel that energy towards the person. So it's not me who is a healer. And to be a healer, you need an intervention of another dimension. So this requires a lot of humility. It's not me. Oh, thank you for healing me. It's not me. I did what you would have done for me if you knew how to channel this. So it takes some time, but it's amazing because um, first of all, it requires this channeling, which is very simple. I teach it all the time. It's extremely simple, but it always require, it requires some uh, self-consciousness and self-observation because you were mentioning a, a somebody who had a problem with kidneys okay it's relationship but what specifically in the relationship that drove me crazy for years because people i was seeing people who would tell me oh that's stress and everything is stress why has stress attack my kidneys and not my liver or my pancreas so the thing about stress that was not good for me it just that didn't clarify my mind and then people would say oh kidneys are fears, strong fears. I said, but what about liver? Liver is also fear. And heart very, very often is also fear. So what are we talking about? So I needed to be more specific for the people to recon reconnect to themselves and recognize and acknowledge the inner conflict they had. So you need two things. You need the person to acknowledge the inner conflict and then you need to channel a certain energy for the person to heal. But more than that, we'll be able to talk about more things about healing later on, probably in the conversation. Oh, absolutely. That's really cool. And I also uh, noticed that you have, uh, you keep mentioning the word humility. Yeah. And I'd like to know more about it. Uh, you, you have mentioned in some of your seminars that for people to receive healing, they have to be in this humble state. They have to be embracing the energy of humility. You also mentioned that when you channel this energy, maybe because the client doesn't quite know how to do that themselves yet, yeah. and you also go into this state of humility. Could you tell us more about what that is, this yes. state of humility? Einstein had a sentence that I kept in my mind ever since I've heard it, and I've heard it for the first time in 1986. So it was a long time ago. He had a sentence that would say something like this. If you encounter a problem in your life, if you don't change your inner program, you will never find a solution. So if your inner program created a problem with that inner 
program, you won't be able to create the solution. So you need a new program. So now for healing, it's the same. What is a symptom? A symptom, and especially a difficult one, a tough one, like a cancer, something like that. It's a call for a change of my way of life. If I don't want to change my way of life, I will never get healed because it's really a call to change my way of life. So it requires humility because if I say, oh, that's rubbish, it doesn't happen. I want to get rid of this. Just wanting to get rid of a symptom doesn't make you get rid of it. That's the first thing. Second thing, healing, and this is, this, this is something strong for people. Healing cannot be an objective. It's not something that we achieve. Healing is something we receive. We live in a world where we think we can achieve everything. Economy is about achievement. Companies are about achievement. The whole finance about the world is achievement. Everything is achievement. Even happiness, they say it's an achievement. It is not. Uh, the way I, I, I see my life is that I got to earn the right to receive things. So I need to change my inner vibration. So instead of getting very nervous, trying to achieve what, what you call healing or the cure, hey, cool down. That's something you need to receive. So it's not up to you, it's about another dimension. So if you can't stay humble, you'll never get to it. But many people, the more you want something, the more it steps away from you. The less you want something, the more it comes to you. So if you become very nervous about an achievement and being healed, that's the best way not to get healed. And again, if you look, Robert, if, you, if we all look around us, there are so many things that are so much greater than us. My little ego, ego is a Greek word that comes from the old Greek that means center, act, the axis. So uh, the ego thinks he's the center of the world. And uh, the ego thinks he knows everything and he knows how to sort out things. But I look at myself and I say, oh, the guy who created my body or your body, Robert, he didn't trust me because all my organs work without my consent. I can be asleep and it works. You don't know, neither do I, what your pancreas is doing now or you don't know what your liver is doing or what your, whatever your bladder is doing, your spleen. We don't know, and they're working. And the less we touch it, the better they work. So if this works alone and the whole thing around us, the sun that sets and comes up and then the moon and then all the, this huge heavens force in which you're in, we're included works so well, how come? Could I ever think that I would be responsible for my healing? It doesn't happen like that. And what happens is that people who think it happens like that create expectations. And the best way for me, for my experience, not to get healed is to have expectations because expectations are not humble. Healing is a possibility. When, when people ask me, do you heal people? No, not everybody. And I, we should refer to it. It's not I, I who heal people. Do I help people get healed? Yes, but with many times it doesn't work. It doesn't, it's not up to me. There are That's reasons, right. we can go through those reasons, okay? There are yeah. reasons for it. I've understood those reasons, but there are reasons for that. So the less you're humble, the more you get away from healing. That's, that's fascinating. And, and I've noticed it in my field of study too. I, I'd like to ask you this. You, you mentioned the word receive. There's like an ability to receive. And uh, you, you then connected it to healing. So like, what does that mean to not be able to receive healing? I, and, uh, go ahead. You know, um, it's fantastic. Uh, and the, the, word is, um, the word is strong. Uh, when I talk about money, I also talk about money in my courses, because when you don't have money, it's the same, it's, it's a symptom in your life. It's not a body symptom, but it's a symptom in your life. When you don't, you don't have a house or a good house or your car is always uh, malfunctioning or anything is malfunctioning, well, 
It's a symptom in your life too. So I don't only heal body symptoms. I also heal or try to heal uh, emotional symptoms, uh, matter symptoms, anything in the world, relationships, whatever. And when I talk about money, I, I tell people that abundance is a vibration. Everything works by vibration. Nothing is natural in our life. I see you, Robert, you see me, because we are a form that takes up space and time. But this is an illusion because we know that what makes this work is something that is invisible. We know it is. Uh, if you ask kids, um, be attentive. Okay, and they get attentive. Use your attention. They become attentive. Yes, they use it. But do, then you ask them, what is it, your attention? What is it? The power of attention, what is it? And then I go across the world and I say, what is your power of attention? And people say, in the heart or in the mind, it's or in, the, in the brain. It's none. It's not in the brain and it's not in the heart. Where is it? It's in our consciousness. Okay, where is our consciousness? Oh, it's in the spirit. Okay, where is the spirit? Where is the soul? By the way, the word animal you, you use the word soul. We Latins use the word alma, alma. That comes from anima. Anima means the one who animates. So an animal from Latin is a um, body that is animated. So uh, the soul means the form that is animated. So it's the source of the animation of the form. And the spirit's the same. The spirit has to do with uh, the a certain... Uh, air with air with a certain blow now back to it um, if I don't connect to the vibration of money I can work like hell do a lot of effort and all the money I get home will be a money with effort if I connect to a vibration of abundance I create my own abundance so people say, how come you receive things you don't work that much and things come to you because you start working on the vibration and for healing, it's the same. So you don't have to act upon something that is outside, nor do you need to want to achieve anything. You just need to change your own vibration through many things, many things about awareness, about superconsciousness, about lots of things. And then you, repeat, you repeat, receive a new state of being, a new state of feeling, a new state of physical body. Really and this new state gives the person the ability to receive, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's really fascinating. And, and I also remember watching some of your presentations is that many people you had mentioned that you met resisted healing. Yeah. And you also mentioned that there's certain fears, such as fears of loss yeah. around or wrapped in this resistance. How does that show up? Like, do, are people aware of that, these fears that they have them? All right. <clears throat> there are many fears around healing. And there are many resistance. Um, many resistances. You know, uh, the first thing, and you know this from NLP, but I found this in every organ of the, of the human body. When you have a disease, You have an unconscious pleasure in having that disease. Of course, if you have a cancer, you're not pleased with a cancer. But the cancer is there because in your life, it allows you to get something that you wouldn't get should you not have the cancer. So there is always, as you say in NLP, a pleasure associated with a certain physical symptom. So imagine, this is, imagine just this. I, got, I, I had one experience once with a guy who was blind. He was not totally blind and he was absolutely in denial about healing or whatever. And when we started working with him and asking him questions, we realized that it was the only way for him to have his wife always being closer to him. The only way I found for my wife never to go away. 
And this happens with depression. This happens with Alzheimer's. This happens with many, many, many symptoms. So when we tell someone that it is possible that he or she may lose that pleasure once he gets healed, people don't like it. Because for them, they're better off with that associated pleasure than with, than with, with healing. Uh, so they prefer unconsciously, of course, they prefer to stay with the symptom because they don't want to lose that pleasure. They are afraid of losing the pleasure. For instance, I am afraid of losing my wife. This happens a lot. Now, there's another thing. If I change my way of life, I will lose potentially, not always, but potentially, some things will be lost. There was a, an American writer, I can't remember the name now, but a very well known, that used to say, for everything you win in life, you lose something. Uh, the guy's very well known, probably I will, it will get back to my mind before the end of the interview. Um, so every time you need to change your way of life, you will lose something. And people are afraid of losing that ones. Second thing, the third thing, you need to be responsible for your healing. The word responsibility means ability of response. So if I delegate that to the doctor, I won't say much. I'm not that much responsible. Is the guy, he's got things in hands, but I should have things in hands as well. I should share responsibility with him or her. Yeah. Now, uh, assuming responsibility for what I've created and assuming responsibility for my healing, oh, people get really afraid of that. Me? Who am I? No, but it's not really you, but you have to acknowledge that fear. And then people are afraid of being alone. They're afraid of not being recognized. They're afraid of not having approval. They're afraid of being uh, um, a fail, uh, failing. They're afraid of lots of things. So they resist. But the biggest resistance I find is when I ask people to get rid of this, um, for instance, to get rid of a belief that is a strong belief in their family or in their culture, they don't want a lot of resistance. Not always only fear, but a lot of resistance. This is fascinating. So I can totally relate because in the world of neurolinguistic programming, we call these uh, benefits or gains secondary gains. Absolutely. And the secondary gain is, even though it says secondary, it is actually a primary consideration. It, it, it sneaks itself into our value system and dictates what becomes important for the person and what is not important. And, and it, it, it creates all kinds of conflicts, you know, and as you, you had mentioned, you know, gets in the way of the healing. And, and I've seen it too. Um, I'd like to ask you, in one of your seminars, you had mentioned that when healing is about to take place, then people want to install beliefs. Or these like beliefs like, oh, I can heal, I will heal, I am going to achieve this, I will be this. Are you, was, are you referring to affirmations or, or what were you talking about specifically then? All right, that's a fantastic question, Robert. It's very much up to date. Uh, you know, I've been following uh, for this last week, um, the Hill Summit with some of your very well-known compatriots from America. I don't know whether you followed or not. Um, with Bruce Lipton and Greg Braden and uh, Deepak Chopra, all from America, all whom I know, all of them, because I've read them all, and I admire them all. And they all talk about beliefs. I am not the beliefs guy. Um, why? This is going to be strong, okay? Can I? Can I carry Please. on? Okay. By all means, honesty and, and authenticity is, is the key. A belief is something that has not happened yet that is supposed to be happening in the future. So I believe, well, of course, it enchants everybody. Everybody sings about believing. Everybody talks about believing. Everybody does poems about believing. But the belief himself is not a good thing because you're not dealing with something that is happening today. You're dealing with future. 
When you're dealing with future, you're dealing with anxiety and expectations. So, I deal with truth. What is the difference between a belief and a truth? A belief comes outside in, from outside. A truth comes from inside. What, I, what happened to me is that I read lots of books and I went to lots of seminars and I still had problems with my kidneys. And I was believing, but really absolutely believing in everything that, was, uh, that I'd been told. And it still didn't work because those beliefs were not mine. It's only when they become mine that there is a change in my vibration, when they become my truth. If you just replace beliefs by other beliefs, you never get out of the ego. And you, sub, you, you replace one expectation by another one. And from my experience, 26 years experience with this, it's very difficult to get healed from a strong symptom with that. So I listen to them and I admire them all um, who say you just need to get rid of bad vibes, negative vibes and change your beliefs and choose which beliefs you want to believe in and choose which emotions you want to live. For me, that's theoretical. I can't tell that to any patient. I don't call them patients because I don't like them to feel like patients. I can't say, tell, say that to anyone because it's theoretical. So uh, the ability to observe, to acknowledge, and to trust it's already happening, that's called faith. Okay. And the guys who talked about faith were... The first ones to talk about faith were the guys in the Middle East some 2,000 years ago, the Hebrews and um, the Christians, and mostly the Christians started talking about faith. When you go to the translations from the, um, the Aramaic to the Latin, you don't find the, the root for the word faith. But you go, when you go from Aramaic to Greek, you find the word faith. And the word faith from the Aramaic to the Greek is pistis. I don't know anything about Greek. But pistis in Greek, I know it means certitude, certainty. It's happening now. So faith is not something that you believe will happen. It's something that you acknowledge that is happening today. And for healing, if you change beliefs, you're never today here. But if you have faith, and faith is nothing to do with divine entities or with religions or whatever, faith means to be fully in your truth here and now. What many people over there in America, there are lots of them, very good writers, write about the power of now. And the power of now is faith. It can't be belief. So if you tell someone, believe you can heal yourself, he will never heal himself. Because he won't change anything now. He will be expecting we have something to come from outside that will change him something. So he expects, he believes, and it doesn't work. So I'm a stronger, strong, strong. I, well, of course, if you, Robert, you use the word belief with a meaning of truth that is happening today, I agree. It's just semantics. But if you use it, talking about something that you hope will happen in future, I'm against that. It doesn't work for healing. Yeah, I, I hear you because it comes from a totally different vibration. So we make the statement, we make the affirmation, but we don't really believe it. You know, it's, it's a fake belief or false belief. And, and I, I learned this some time ago that the universe doesn't hear what we say, it hears what we mean. And the meaning is the vibration. Fantastic, so, Robert. Fantastic what you so, just said. Oh, thanks. So I'd like to ask you something. Um, when you describe the process of healing, and of course it could be financial, it could be relationship or bodily or matter, you mention that the inner world, the inner vibration has to change. It has to adjust. What does this mean in everyday terms? All right. 
<laughs> good question. It's a strong one. Okay. Um, first, the technical part, and then I'll get back to the day by day part. We know that, and you know that as well because you work with quantum, um, we know that we have um, the unity, everything is together. Before the Big Bang, everything is together. So we have the unus, unus from Latin, which means one, the one, the unus. And the unus starts, uh, joins with verses, universe. A verse comes also from Latin, and it comes from vertere, which is a word in Latin that means spinning. So the unus started, started spinning, started a movement of spinning. And of course, when you start spinning, you create two forces, one that goes outside and the centrifugal, and then the one that goes inside the centripetal. And what happens is this strong one that goes outside is called the yin force and the gun that comes inside is a yang force. So you have yin and yang because of the movement of the unus. The oneness starts movement, spinning, it creates yin and yang. And that yin and yang creates waves. So in this huge unified uh, um, field called the universe, starts spinning, creates waves. And by creating waves, if you adapt the correct vibration, it means the movement of the energy you're working with to a certain to a certain wave you make matter appear matter appears and when matter appears then you have something that changes in your body now this is the first one so i need to change my and by changing my vibration i create uh, subatomic particles, and then I create um, minerals and vegetables and uh, uh, animals, and of course, I have us. So we are all part of this unus that starts vertering versus, right? Now, what does this mean in our day to day life? What is vibration? What causes vibration? What alters vibration? Thoughts, ego. Substitutions, a replacement of uh, beliefs. Uh, living all your emotions. Receiving intuition. All those alter your vibration. The problem is some of them alter your vibration from inside out and some others from outside in. When you alter your vibration from outside in, you can become dependent from that engine that made you change your vibration. So I always work the change of the vibration inside out. What is the biggest change you can make in your life to change your vibration inside out? Address all your emotions and your inner conflicts. Address all your emotions and your inner conflicts. Means what? Anger, fear, sadness, anxiety, shame, guilt, and so on and so forth, normally they're not addressed. And by not being addressed, every emotion, every emotion that you do not address becomes a symptom. An emotional or mainly a physical one. So every physical symptom has to do with an emotion that has been hidden. The person has the idea of having solved the emotion, but they don't do it. So the first way how to tackle vibration is by living your emotions fully and by going and talk to the people with whom you felt those emotions, dad, mom, the teacher, the boss, the wife, the, the whatever, the neighbor, who will. Now, and that's, may, that's extremely important. So the first thing I tell people is, your symptom comes from something you've hidden. There was a repression. Ah, get out of here, that's not true. I've already tackled all those emotions. They've done it theoretically. And because when you say, you need to choose which emotions you want to live, people intellectualize emotions and they don't live them. And without realizing, they're hiding emotions. It's not 
Of course, it's not something that they want to do, but it's something that happens. So the first thing is addressing your inner conflicts and living your emotions. The third thing is working with subtle energy. Working with subtle energy is something I became a specialist with because I found it in the, I was so lucky. In 1994, I went to a guy who was absolutely working with the invisible and I started working with the invisible and it works. So sometimes, not always, uh, I see someone um, and that person has um, a problem. I talk to the person, she faces her conflicts and I do some things with the energy and the symptom goes away. And people ask me, but did you know the symptom was going to go away? I didn't know anything. I never know what's going to happen. Should I know what, what was going to happen? I would be God or whatever entity that is at oneness. No, I just channeled something. So I changed my vibration because instead of focusing on the forms of matter, of everything we see, I focused on something that you in quantum know very well, which is in the energy of things that is invisible which by the way, an atom is 99.99999% empty space. People don't understand this. A proton has nothing inside. An electron has nothing inside. And it's only space in an atom. You know, by the way, this is something I always like to play with. The word atom should disappear from our vocabulary. Because in Greek, tome means division. And A means impossible to. So, atom means from the Greek many years ago, from Newton, impossible to divide. And we know it's not true. Yeah. We know that the atom have sub, has some subatomic particles. So, we should get away from the world, uh, the word uh, atom, and call it something else because it's not atom, it's tome. It's <laughs> tome, it's not at. Yeah, I love that. That's, so, so, that's really amazing. I, I, I absolutely love, love your approach. And <clears throat> I'd like to ask you that you are big on intuition. Yeah. And I personally have noticed that, that many people have issues with intuition. Yeah. In your teachings, you mentioned that the moment we get disconnected or we misinterpret or somehow we mismanage our intuition, then our emotional world starts to speak to us. Yeah. It has messages. And the moment we ignore those emotions, then our body starts to talk. So something's always talking to us. Yeah. And I'd like to know more about your explanation why intuition is so important and what has happened to most people and why they are not able to tap into it and use it correctly or, or okay. channel it incorrectly. Okay, Robert, if you allow me, I'm going to answer the second question first, and then we go back to the first. Absolutely. One. And if I forget, please remind me about the first one. Okay. Why do some people just do not get in touch with their intuition? Why can't they receive their intuition? Um, intuition is, uh, you know, in the universe, we talked about the universe, yang and yin. If you have a glow of light, some some light coming the light is extreme and especially if you have a laser is extremely coherent it's the youngest you have not the young the young uh, the, the from the chinese word it's very very young yang very very yang and um, shadow is very yin we know that the, so yang is something that is very yang is something very determined very concise, very coherent, very strong. It's like a beam of light. <coughs> That's why you Americans, you also call intuition an insight, right? Something I'm calling from, from within, an insight. The word intuition comes from Latin as well. Tuition, you know what tuition stands for? No. You know, when you go to university, you're the only ones to use it correctly because you only go to university, you have to pay for your tuitions. Okay, most people here in the Latin world, they don't know what tuition means. Tuition means knowledge. Mm. And in, from inside, in tuere, from the Latin, means, intuition means receiving the knowledge coming from inside. 
This is the, the atom etymology of the world. It's beautiful. It's like an insight, as you say. It's an insight. It's something that comes from inside. Intuition is the same. Okay, and that is light that comes from inside. It doesn't only come from inside, because if I am um, a part of this universe versus this universe, this huge field of possibilities, then it's everywhere, because atoms are everywhere. We don't see them, but they're there, right? So if it, ha it comes, it's the strongest, the most yang strength there is here in our universe, on this land as well, uh, at least on Earth. So if I, this is about intuition. Now imagine I am a guy who's always certain about everything. I know things for sure. I'm always sure. I'm very aggressive. I'm very um, based on go for it. I'm very willingly. My behavior is young, is yang. My behavior is very yang. Uh, I'm very, very, very warrior. Okay, I'm attacking. Yang with wang, with yang, they repel each other. So since intuition is a beam of light, it's very yang. If I'm yang outside, I know things for sure. I reason a lot. I never receive intuition. So for me to receive intuition and to get my insights, I need to be yin on the outside. What does that mean? I need to be flexible, open, listening, open to different ideas. Those guys who are more Zen, if you want, it's like a, if you go, you go to the, I don't know, the jungle and you, or not the jungle, but the savanna, you see a lion running after whatever, a deer. The deer is by definition, very yin outside. They're cool, they're always cool. And you realize they have you, their eyes on the side. They see everything, they're attentive to anything. They are very, very much listening, attentive, flexible. The, those are the preys. The lions, they have the lions, leopards and all those. They have their eyes in front. They are yang outside. And um, when you are like a prey in our normal today life, they say you're not good enough because you're a bad employee, because you're not good for salespeople, whatever, or you're not a good director or a good CEO or whatever. So they want you all to be very yang outside, very much like the lion. Eat one another because you'll be stronger, be competitive, be conflictive, live in separation. That makes me very much yang outside. So what happens is I never get a clue of intuition or insight. So the visionary guys, and you have a lot in America, the visionary guys started being people who were very yin outside. You won't get a vision if you are very much yang on the outside. So the more you're competitive, aggressive, conflictive, based on separation, the less you get connected to intuition, the less you get insights. Right? This is for the second question. So you need to be softer. You need to be zener. You need to adopt. Uh, this is a cliche, but you should adapt a more feminine way of doing things. Not so strong, just sweeter. You see what I mean? Yeah. Then you receive intuition. A lot of intuition. So here when I'm speaking to you, I'm young on the outside because I have to... I need to be a spot of light. And when you receive me, you're extremely yin on the outside. But when you ask me things, I become yin, yin in the outside and you become yang on the outside. Because when we talk, we need to be yang, yang on the outside. The problem is people are, so you know how, when to be yin outside and when to be yang outside. Most people don't. And they stay their lives the whole day long, yang in the outside. And then they say, I never get, my intuition, I never foresee things. I have no precognition, of course. And by the way, one of the things that allows us to receive intuition is observation and contemplation, to observe and to contemplate. 
What, what was the second word? Observation? Contemplation. Contemplation. What Contemplation. You I see. You, you know, you know those, that word in English? Or am yeah, I yes. here? Yes, yeah? I couldn't hear it. That's all. Okay. Contemplation and observation. And um, when you observe, you can't think. And when you think, you can't observe. Interesting. When you think, you cannot contemplate. So if you think too much, you're reasoning too much, you have this Cartesian thinking all the time, you'll never receive the intuition or the insight because Cartesian thinking is extremely yang on the outside. Try to observe. If you want to observe, you won't think. Well, I had some classes of yoga some years ago and the, the teacher would say, Okay, he would tell us how to be, and I did this for years. And he said, now observe what you feel. And nobody was observing. Everybody was thinking, uh, does it hurt here? Do I have a problem there? Is this cool enough? Is this tense? You're not observing, you're thinking. Uh, you had a singer, Yogi Berra, that would say, you can observe a lot just by watching. You can't we watch, we think. When you think, you do not observe. The, the, the moment on which you start thinking, you stop observing. So you stop receiving. <laughs> I see. That's amazing. Now, the first question, the first question about what is intuition? I've already said some words about that. Intuition is like a beam of light that comes from inside. Intuition, we're all connected. You know that, I know that. Everything is connected because if the atoms are empty, your thoughts are not inside your head. They are somewhere around your head. And my thoughts are also around my heart, my head. So our thoughts are not in forms inside of our brains. They are in flows in the waves that we are entangled with. Okay, so you're connected to me, I'm connected to you. If I'm yang on the outside, I'll never be connected to you and you'll never be connected to me. Maybe you connect to me, but I can't connect to you because I'm yang on the outside. So, to be able to be part of this huge field, huge unified field with lots of waves, with all this spinning, by the way, the DNA is part of it because it's spinning in spiral. It's the same that happens in the universe. If I wanna be part of that, I want to recognize, I need to recognize that you are me and I am you. So we can't be separated. So intuition is um, when connection happens. It's a glow of light, it's a beam of light. You know, you are light, I am light, because we come from somewhere else. We don't come from Earth. Plants come from Earth. Animals come from somewhere else. And then they need their body to start moving on earth. But you know that today they do, um, they fertilize eggs with a, sp a sperm in a lab. You know what happens? They've already, they've already filmed this. You know what happens when there is the fertilization? There's a glow of light. They see it in labs. Light is our inner essence. So getting connected to intuition, what is intuition? Is our inner essence. What kind of inner essence? Light. Why is it that tomorrow you go to the countryside and you go with some friends and some kids and some old people, and at a certain point in time, there are lots of stars in the sky and everybody gets down and starts looking at the stars. From the one who is 80, to the one who is seven and everybody watches the stars. Why are we so much enchanted with the stars? Because that's light. That's our true essence. We come from there. We are light. So intuition is just reconnecting to our pure essence. Something that you can't see, but you can recognize it exists. You can't see it but you see, it produces a result. Absolutely brilliant. I, I really appreciate the answer. Just, I'm fascinated. So I'd, I'd like to ask you in your experience, 
since you work with people from all walks of life, what is a common reason for them to not connect or be able to connect to the intuition? You, you mentioned that they are too yang, you know, on the other side. That's, you know, like, like they are not able to receive. Is there anything else that, that you have observed that, that uh, people do or, you know, that would actually di disconnect them from this uh, insight? Yeah. One of the things that makes you very yang on the outside is non-addressing inner conflicts that have been there for year, for ages. They even come from previous lives sometimes. And um, not being able to live emotions. Look, one of the things that makes me very yang is the way I live emotions. People say they talk about substituting emotions, replacing emotions. Choose the emotions you want to live. It doesn't happen that way. Because if I feel fear, fear never needs to be overcome. If I feel anger, I should not overcome anger. If I feel sadness, just to give three examples, sadness can't be overcome. If I overcome an emotion, an emotion, I won't solve it because I haven't lived it. So what I need is to live my fear, to live my anger, and to live my sadness. So I have to recognize that moment. Now, we come to something that is very strong. Every person I met who had cancer had blocked emotions for that associated pleasure we've talked about, OK? Um, they have blocked emotions. Why? Because if I talk to my, I don't know, my family about all my inner conflicts, it's going to be, I'm going to ruin my family. I'd rather have my family together and still have my cancer. Okay? If I address this issue here, people will be mad. They won't like it. I'm going to ruin my family. Let's keep the family together. And I sacrifice myself. Yeah. Self-sacrificial right? behaviors. Yeah. yeah, it's a sacrificial behavior um, with sometimes victimization. They become victims. Yes. And they have self-pity. Um, and uh, when I don't live emotions, how come I do not live emotions? Because I live the behavior instead of living the emotion. I feel angry. I go and I shout against you. I say, rah, rah, rah. have I lived my anger? No, you haven't, Louis. You haven't lived your anger. You lived the behavior that came from anger, that was triggered by anger. But you have not lived the anger, you have lived the behavior. So people think that by living that behavior itself, they live the behavior that is triggered by emotion, or they won't allow themselves to live the emotion blocking behavior. So they use behavior before and after the emotion. So they think they've done their homework. They haven't. When you live an emotion with your behavior, you become very yang on the outside. And this is the most difficult thing I encounter everywhere. Why? Because you run the whole world. You won't find anybody who tells you truthfully and practically how should I address and live my emotions instead of just choosing what emotions I want to have? Because when I choose, I choose, people say this. Say you choose to be happy and not sad anymore. And repeat that a hundred times. <laughs> Repeating a hundred times a lie doesn't become a true. It doesn't make it a true, right? So I've just repeated 100, 100 times a lie. First of all, it's not an inner truth. And secondly, this is a carnival. This doesn't work. Yeah. Because I've not lived that sadness. You, we need to leave emotions for emotions to disappear. So um, then, again, back to your question. Another thing that I encounter very often is that people are in survival mode. They're not in evolution mode. Somebody who is in survival mode, and they come to me when they've tried everything. They've been to doctors, they've been to surgery, they've been to chemotherapy, they've been to, uh, then they come to me because they get to know me. 
It never works. It never works. It would need a total mindset change that they're not able to, and they don't even want to. So it's never going to work because they're not ready to face all that homework. Yeah. You see what I mean? Back to the responsibility. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've been doing you know, this for 11 years and had the courage to deep dive into some of the, the scariest traumas and most uncomfortable circumstances. And so I, I can totally relate. I, I yeah. so appreciate all your wisdom. This is really amazing. So um, Louis, I, I, I'd like to ask you, what do you do in your spare time? How do you spend, you know, what does life look like for you? All right. Uh, my, um, there is a very, very old Zen Buddhist saying that says, the master, when he's in the art, practicing his art, he never knows whether he's working or he's practicing, practicing leisure. Is it work? Is it leisure? And he ends up saying, I don't know the difference. Right? No. Uh, it was not always like this. But this that I do became my life. So observation, contemplation, and uh, uh, being in on the outside, connecting to the air, connecting to light, connecting to intuition, is a big part of my leisure time. I read a lot. I listen to lots of people. I love to travel, although for the moment it's not possible. Uh, not possible because I don't want to, it's too messy. And uh, I live uh, not far, at a short distance from the beach. And um, I walk very, very often at the beach. Then I socialize, I have friends, I like to have, I don't like, um, going out like crazy for raves and things like that, but I like dinners. But I must tell you one thing, I am very solitary. I'm a very solitary man. Because many discussions people have, I just don't like them. Mm -hmm. They talk about competition, they talk about stress, they talk about society, they talk about the rules, they talk about COVID, they talk about lots of things that I'm not interested in. So I feel very solitary, which is, it's okay for me because I don't feel isolated. And that's not, I, I, I have lots of friends and I have a, a, a ability to socialize, but very often I refuse some events because I don't want to talk about that. Because starting to talk about the government and about the corruption, I immediately get yang on the outside. If we both would start talking about corruption now, we will all immediately become yang outside and not want that. So it's by far enough when I have to deal with those things. And when you have to deal with things from the government and finance and whatever, that's enough. So I don't want that for my life. So I, I've started a path, a quest for a solitary um, uh, interconnection. So I live very solitary, but, but I live, live very happy. So I built my house where I live. I have children and I meet my children very often, um, but uh, they're not, they, 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 they're old enough already. So they don't live with me. So I have friends, but I, I love to do what I do and to take care of my garden and walk. And I, I like to travel, that's all. And listen to music oh. I talk to you and talk to you. Oh. That's really awesome. I, I can totally relate. Uh, you know, I, I live very similarly to you. You know, I, I keep things to myself. I love to study. I love to read all those things. So, uh, Louis, what is next for you? Like, is there anything on the horizon, something that really inspires you, something you'd like to do or embrace? Um, you know, when you create, when you start a new era, and we are starting a new era where there's, um, we start drifting from this um, competition, separation, yang life on the outside, towards a cooperation, connection, and unity, living at one. Uh, I want to be part of this movement. 
So my way of contributing is with my seminars. I do lots of workshops. I, I have a, a school that I call the School of Spirituality in Matter, because what I want is to rule matter with spirituality and not, spirituality must have a purpose. Spirituality for spirituality is not interesting to me. I call spirituality everything that has to do with the invisible and with all the flows. So I, I, I do for my life, I always solve matter out from spirituality. So when I have a problem, I, do not, I don't do anything to solve it. I create the solution and it appears. And then I have to deal with matter because the solution appears. And uh, I've started doing some international healing workshops. I've done it very locally in Portugal. I've written, I've, I've sent that information with my site that you know, www.flowsandforms.com, which is the site you know, where the Does Your Body Lie book is in. Um, I've opened uh, a workshop called International Healing Workshop, where I'd like people to come from all over the world. There is some resistance to come to workshops. Hmm. Um, although I have that website, I'm not that well known, and um, I don't do. I want. I don't want to be in, do any advertising and any marketing. I will teach those who come to me. I'm gonna, going to spread the word. So I have some videos that you've seen. I have a website. I have books. If people get to know me through things like yours, and I'm very grateful, or others, they will come. We've had one during the COVID. It was fantastic. There were people coming from New Zealand, from America, from, from uh, Spain, from Belgium, a little bit from everywhere, it was, and even from Portugal. It was fantastic because we lived the beginning of the COVID in a seminar, um, a healing seminar. It was absolutely, we laughed like hell. It was so nice because we were really doing something different from what was going to happen, happening on, on the outside. So my next step is contribute to this new era, working with subtle energy and with healing. That's what I'm focused on. That's really awesome. I don't, I don't want to achieve it. Huh? If okay. I have to do it, I will receive it. That's really awesome. I, I, I really appreciate your wisdom. And if, if people wanted to like find you or get in touch with you or interested in taking your seminars, where could they find you? I will okay. post the link in, in our episode description. Right. Uh, it's, uh, I'll send you an email with that if you, if you okay. then, Perfect. okay. But uh, because it's, it's info, I-N-F-O, at my name.com okay. you know my name right yes so it's info information but info at luis martins simoes.com it's info at my name.com and then we we give feedback to everybody in the world there is a, a, a website which is the flows and forms.com and there's another website which is my name.com <laughs> okay Okay. I, will, I will share those links in the, the, okay. the description. Thank you so. very much. Thank and, you. Um, well, I'm, I'm really ready to, uh, to receive anybody who wants. No, it's awesome. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm incredibly honored and, and super excited that, that we, we got to meet and, and, and talk to you. I uh, thank you for your time and, and thank you for this opportunity. Don't mention it. I'm grateful, very grateful to you having and, given me this opportunity. And, and, and I feel it, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very intuitive myself and, and I, I felt from the moment we uh, started to exchange emails, uh, your, your humbleness, your humility, your, your kindness, your, your, your authenticity. So thank you, Louis, so much for joining us today. This was an absolutely amazing session I, or, or a talk. I, I learned so much and I also appreciate you as, as a person, as an individual, I, I, the character and, and the authenticity. So. I'm very grateful that we have met. And ladies and gentlemen, tune in next week for the next episode. And until then, just stay intuitive. You know, trust your insights. And if you have any questions, then reach out to Lewis or myself. Take care. Cheers. <laughs>